This uh, mother was taking her three children to church one morning and she wanted to remind them to be quiet. You ready, Scott? Wanted to re remember for them to be quiet. And so she said, and, and remember, why, why, are, why, are we, why must we be quiet in church? And to which her little boy responded, because the people are sleeping. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, okay. All right. Hey, but that's not you because uh, I know you're not sleeping because that <laughs> we talked last week about one thing and I told you at the beginning and at the end what the sermon was about before, you know, so that you knew. What was it about last week? Work is good all the time. All the time work is good. Well, maybe not all the time, but in principle, the, in, what I mean by that is innately work is a good thing. God ordained work. God, wor God works. And God works six days and rested on the seventh. And sometimes we get that confused and we think this is the time where we engage in God's activity on Sunday. And through the rest of the week, uh, you know, we're kind of, we're resting from God's activity. But that's exactly the opposite of the way God uh, s established the rhythm of creation, that we would be a part of his work. We, we would connect our work to God's greater work throughout, throughout the week. And uh, we often think that work is something bad. You know, it's, a, it's something we have to toil at. That is a result of the fall, that women would have pain in childbirth, it says, and men would toil in the field, and the field would not produce like we'd like it to. But, but God's original design is, is that we would work. And I even made the case that I think we're going to be working in heaven. We want to be occupied and employed for God. Um, so it's important that we connect our work to God's work. I want to shift gears a little bit today as we continue in this, uh, un our understanding of work. I wanted to look at Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. Luke chapter 3, 21 through 23. And this is Jesus before he has begun his earthly ministry. This is Jesus before he has begun his work. Okay? This is, this is what happens here. Uh, Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. A voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. So last week I told you that... Uh, Work is good, and so I want to tell you straight up right now what you need to know this week before I continue, and that is this. You are God's beloved child. That's who you are. I'm God's beloved child. Would you say that? I'm God's beloved child. You know, work confuses this. We mix up our identity all the time because of work. This last week, I was volunteering at Mankato Brewery. You can talk up to me about that later. And, we, and, uh, and I was just trying to meet some other people in the community. And when I, when I went there, I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make sure, I'm gonna make sure that they, they, they don't find out that I'm a preacher too early or the conversation will shut down, right? And so I just, I didn't, I didn't really know uh, what I would say. So I prepared a few questions in my mind. I just want to meet people. And I said, I know what I'll ask them. I'll say, when you're not here doing this, uh, doing this work, what other things do you like to do for fun? What's your hobbies, you know? So we, I started this conversation and that went on for a while. But then it was quickly get about to turn to a work conversation because it doesn't take long in our conversations for them to turn back to work. And so then I said, so I thought I had another question ready in case that happened. I said, hey, hey, forget about that right now. If Steven Spielberg were making a motion picture of your life, who would you like to play you in the movie? To kind of get them, and we started talking about different actors and actresses and stuff, but it wasn't long before the conversation quickly turned back to someone, someone thought of something they do and what they work at, and, and pretty soon when they talk to you about their work, they ask you, so what do you do? And I just don't want to tell them because I just feel like they'll never be my friend. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, or the conversation will shut down. But it's just amazing how quickly, how quickly our conversation turns to work. I do this all the time. In fact, you guys come in here often for pastoral care, and it's not long before Fred's telling you about his vision for the future. And, you know, work, like we were doing the other day. I just talk about work all the time. Work becomes who we are. And uh, if we spend, we spend in our uh, working life, we spend 96,000 hours at work. Only 2,200 at church, but 96,000 hours at work. It's really important that we understand how to connect what we do to what God's doing. And it's really important that we don't, Mix up who we are with our work. It's easy to do because we spend so much time at it. So say this with me. I am not my work. 
I'm at my work. I like when you guys say things with me. Say this, Pastor Fred is awesome. <laughs> Just, all right, all right. Okay, so uh, you guys are so obedient. Uh, here, so here's a question. If you are not your work, then who are you? I already told you. You are the beloved sons and daughters of God. This is who you are. You are God's beloved. And your identity is being challenged by your work. Henry Nouwen, and I, I've preached this message before, but I think it's important, but he talks about, Henry Nouwen talks about how our life is a, a, a chronology. It's a clock time. And it's, uh, my, this is my life on the screen. I was born in 1970. I'm going to die in 2050. Because the average lifespan of, of a Minnesotan is about 80. And is that right? And so, uh, uh, so that's not a big time. I mean, it is, it is you know, compared to, a few minutes, but it's not a big time and compared to eternity, compared to all of cre- the created order. This is a small, just a small little life that we have. And most of our life is trying to understand this. Who am I? Maybe we don't fit verbally ask the question to ourselves, but we're trying to establish who we are. We're trying to figure out our identity. And one of the things that Henry Nouwen says that we do to figure out our identity is this. We say to ourselves, I am what I do. I am what I do. We confuse this all the time. And so when we do good things, when we do good things, we feel really good. And when we fail, we we get incredibly depressed because it's an attack on our identity. Because it's tied up with what we do. Tim Keller writes this. He says, our identity is misplaced in our work. If you're successful, it destroys you because it goes to your head. And if you're unsuccessful, it also destroys you because it goes to your heart. I remember when my dad, uh, my dad worked at the Wyndham State Bank for 28 years, and a new bank came in and, uh, and swallowed it up, and clear out your desk by Monday morning. Three days over the weekend, he had to clean out a desk after 28 years. But what was really, uh, really telling was when a, a man came up to him on the street, of, you know, a small town Wyndham, everybody knew Gary the banker. That's what he is, Right. And when the guy came, a friend of my dad's came up to him on the street and says, he says, Gary, it's like I'm looking at a ghost. Because without your work, who are you? Because our identity is so tied up in our work. So if, if our work is gone, then we think we're also just sort of a spirit lingering with no body. Or when you visit people uh, of visit elderly people, you often hear stories right away that come out of elderly folks' mouth is, is you know, I, I served in the war, and I, I built this bridge, and my company did this, and, and I, I own this many acres, and they, and they talk about all the accomplishments throughout their life, because why? They want to make sure that you know that even though they're not working now, they are somebody. They've done something. They are what they have done, right? Not just elderly, though, right? I do that all the time. I always tell people, you know, I used to be a good hurdler, you know, or, or I used to be, or, you know, Stacy and I, we, we were missionaries in Ukraine. I, you notice me. I am somebody. And my work says that I am. And if, so I'm, if I'm no longer engaged in successful work, I'm like really fearful that my identity is being lost. So look at my trophies to prove it. Henry Nowen also goes on to say that there's another way that we try to identify seek to answer the question, who am I? And the other way is this, I am what they say. I am what others say about me. This is also tied up with our work. This is incredibly powerful because what people say is so very important to us. When people speak well of us, we feel awesome. And when when people speak ill of us, we're depressed, we're deeply hurt. Or if people say nothing at all when they needed to, it could ruin us for a lifetime. It's like the applause meter on The Tonight Show, you know? If we're getting applause, wow, our life, we are somebody. But if we're not, or if it goes below the zero line, we get a negative comment, it deeply grieves us. Ron Sniff this week, uh, couple, yesterday, pulled me out of the back room. I was talking to, to the ladies, uh, and uh, <laughs> that's how I talking to the ladies. No, I was talking to church ladies, and... Uh, <laughs> And Ron Sniff pulled me out of the room and he said, Pastor Fred, I need to talk to you. He was shoveling snow and he said, I want to tell you, that you I, I want to remind you again how well you did that funeral on, on Wednesday. 
And he, he made a point of encouraging me, and it just felt, it felt so good. But here's the thing. If Ron didn't say that, or if I bombed it, if I didn't do well, I'm still somebody, you know? We depend, though, so much on people's positive comments. And, when, and the thing is, all this church, all the way up to here, could say, Fred, Pastor Fred, you're doing excellent. And then, uh, and then Cheryl Emery says, wow, you really tanked. And whose voice will I hear? Cheryl's. <laughs> I picked Cheryl because she's like the last one who would say that. But I uh, could have picked, uh, I'm not going to name who I could have picked. Okay, so anyway... Uh, but this is, we're so wrapped up in what people think about us and, and with 96 hours of our life being centered on our working career and, and work, we, we think that uh, if we don't get affirmation for that time spent, we're worthless, we're without identity. Sticks and stones may, bake, may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a bunch of bunk because words cut deep. Words cut deep and if we're lucky, it will only ruin our day and not our life. The third way Henry Nouwen talks about how we, uh, we uh, try to answer the question in a short little life is, uh, I am what I have. I am what I possess. And so this is why we get the, the car, the house, the boat, the 401k, the bike, the phone, the skinny jeans, the shoes. Because we are what we have. We are what we possess. And when we have that one more thing, if, it, if that's finally in place, well, then maybe I'll be something. But the thing is that it's so tied to work, though. Because what we possess is, is often because of our salary or our wage. And if we don't have it, well, then we're, we're not as good as the neighbors next to us. We don't have what they have. And so we, again, feel like I'm nothing unless I have these pieces in place. I see people all the time. We want to get just that, if I just get this next thing, I'll have it all. I'll be, I'll be a person of importance, a person of worth. My identity is wrapped in this. But the truth is, there'll be a time when we won't be able to work, won't be able to earn a wage, we won't be able to, we won't have health. And if that's the case, well then, we won't be able to have stuff. And we'll slip into deep depression because we're not, because our worth is tied up in that. So most of our life energy is caught up in, in staying above the line. Can we go to the next slide? I am what I do. I am what they say. I am what I have. And we spend so much time trying to say, stay above that chronological life line. Let's go to the, one more slide, Jeff. And so our life becomes a zigzag. When I perform well, I'm up. And when I, people speak well of me, I'm up. But when they say something bad of me, I plummet. And when I have a lot of things, I'm up. But when I lose those things, when I lose my job, when I no longer have a job, it goes down. When, 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 I, when I have failed or when someone spoke against me, someone said something ill about me, I go below the line, I fall back into despair. And there's, this is life, you know, up and down and up and down. And sometimes it feels like that. And it becomes this huge zigzag. And it's not life at all. What it is is survival. It's just survival, but Jesus came that we might have life, and what are we doing? We're just surviving. And it's, so, and it's because work, because we misunderstand that we are not what we do. We are not what we do. Our worth and identity is, found, is not found in our accomplishments or our good name or in our possessions. The problem is this. If you believe that it comes from accomplishments, your good name, or your possessions, the problem is this. Sooner or later you die. Sooner or later 2050 hits and you're gone. And when you're dead, you're dead, right? Is that true? <laughs> you can no longer do anything when you're dead. Isn't that interesting? So if you are what you do, well, now you're not doing anything. And people don't talk about you when you're gone. So it doesn't matter what they say. And you can't take anything with you. So what about your possessions? So now your identity is completely wiped out. If this is how you decide to define who you are. The truth is this, that this is a lie. This is not who we are. This is not who we are. You are God's beloved son and daughter. That's who you are. That's chiefly at the core of who you are, God's beloved son and daughter. You know, Jesus in this text, God, God it's, it's interesting in this text that when before Jesus goes down for baptism, before God proclaims his identity and my son, Jesus hasn't done anything yet. He hasn't done any miracles yet. He, hasn't, uh, he doesn't have crowds chasing after him yet. 
He hasn't gone to the cross yet. Nothing has happened. He hasn't called the disciple yet. And it's in this point, it's this, this point before he starts his work, before he starts his work, God opens up the heavens and says, You are my son, and I'm already pleased with you. Like before, you get what I'm saying here? Before he does anything, God is pleased. He's not what he does. Who is he? He's God's son. But it's also interesting in chapter 4, it's challenged right away. Chapter 4 is, you know, the, the very next section. He comes up out of the waters and then where does he go? Out into the wilderness to pray. And, the, and Satan comes and tempts him for 40 days. Remember this? And what does Satan say? He challenges what God said. Because God says, you are my son. And, and Satan comes back and says, if you are the son of God. He's challenging his identity. If you are the son of God, then turn these stones to bread. Do something. Perform. If you really are the Son of God, you are what you do. And then he says, you know what you could, if you are the, if you are the Son of God, go up to the temple, throw yourself off, and see if the crowds will lift you up. You know? See if, if they come to your rescue. Because you are what they say about you. The third temptation is, if you are the Son of God, to come up on this mountain and look, all, look at everything. I will give you it all. It's all the kingdoms of the earth will belong to you if you just bow to me. You can have possession. You can have everything. And Jesus looks at Satan and says, that's a lie! Right? I'm not any of those things. I'm God's beloved son. And he's pleased with me. See, the thing is about people, if we're waiting for them to praise us, and the thing is about careers, if we're waiting to find our identity there, it just goes up and down all the time. It's not forever like the words of God that Aaron prayed in the pastoral prayer. The word of God it lasts forever. But jobs come and go. Praises of people come and go. And what we have comes and goes. You know, in the first part of the week, they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And by the end of the week, they said, crucify him. People are fickle. Ron Sniff praised me this week. What's he saying about me now? <laughs> you know, it's just, we can't rely on that. Ron's awesome. But we can't rely on it, you know? Because people are up and down like this, and work is up and down like this. And people pressed into Jesus, you know, and they demanded, uh, as the crowd starts following them, they, they demanded that he would give them a miracle. And the disciples even went looking for him one day because they're like, there's all these people that demand your attention. They demand your work. You need to come and, and see to them. They're sick. They need healing. And Jesus is nowhere to be found. He's off on a hill praying. It's interesting. You would think, if, if I was Jesus, I would be working. Because there's so much work that needs to be done. But Jesus doesn't get his identity in work. Jesus gets his identity from God, and so he knows that if he's going to do work well, he needs to get off to a mountain and pray and hear the eternal voice, not the temporal voices, but the eternal voice that says who he is. My beloved son. He needs to reconnect to the Father. He says, calls him his beloved son with whom he is pleased. Jesus gets that. And what is said about Jesus from the Father is said about you and I. Turn to Gal Galatians chapter 4 just for a second. Galatians chapter 4, 4 through 7. It says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then you're also an heir through God. You see, what is said about Jesus, his, God's beloved Son is said about you and I. We are God's beloved. Jeremiah 31.3 says it this way, I have loved you with an everlasting love. This is what God says about you and I. 
I have written your name in the palm of my hand for all eternity. It comes from Isaiah 49, 16. You know, my, my son Madden really needs praise all the time and really is very competitive and wants to see if dad and mom are watching, you know, and before he gets up to, to do something like uh, 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 hit a what, baseball, yeah, hit a baseball, he looks back at us to see if we're looking. And then he, when he swings, he swings for the fences, right? And so every time, he, before he gets up there, I, I said, come over here now. Come over here and listen to me. I don't care if you hit a home run. I don't care if you strike out. I don't care if you go to first or second base. Because none of that matters. What matters is this. You are mine. It's not based on your performance. It's not based on your work. You are mine. You're my beloved child. Our Heavenly Father is like that. I'm talking to the workaholics in the room. Your identity doesn't come there. Your identity doesn't come there. Our Heavenly Father doesn't love you because of what you do. You are not what you do. He loves you because you're his. That's where your identity comes from. What would it look like on Monday morning if you knew that to be true? Everybody say, I'm God's beloved child. What would that look like if you just believed what you were, you were saying? What would Monday morning look like? What would it look like? How would you do your job differently if that were true? If that's where your identity came from. And how, how would you do your job differently? How would you interact with your coworkers if that was true? Because your coworkers don't know that, some of them. What would Monday morning look like if it was really true that you believe that you are God's beloved child? See, our clock time, this, this time that we have that we spend most of our time trying to figure out who we are and try to avoid death, we, ha we have to stop listening to temporal voices. We have to listen to the voice that calls from all eternity as we engage our 96,000 hours. We've got to hear the right voice, that I'm not what I do. I am not my work. I am God's beloved child. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know this because your words tell us, but we don't, I don't know, we don't, we haven't learned it, I guess. We're so wrapped up in what we do and what people say and what we possess. and It affects our joy. It affects our real life. Would you break us free from the survival mode that we find ourselves in and help us to understand who we are in you. Amen.